do you know how often women and how often men were mentioned during the um, process of the scrutiny committee when, uh, when they were talking about domestic abuse and the domestic abuse bill? Guess how often women were mentioned and how often men were mentioned? Mm -hmm. Women and girls were mentioned 400 times and men as victims were mentioned four times. Oh. Um, and out of the four times, they were actually only mentioned twice in a, in a real way and twice they were mentioned in a minimizing way. I watch four, I watch four days of um, parliamentary TV, all the interviews and everything they did with, with the um, committee. And they were mentioned on one occasion and it was when respect, it was in discussion with the respect line. Mm -hmm. um, and the way Women's Aid um, put it, that uh, the statement was, of course, men are getting help through respect. And that was it. The conversation was ended. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit later, it came out at one sentence. Says, yes, but that's perpetrators, isn't it? You know, this, this misrepresentation of what help looks like for a man. And that was the only in four days. That was the only time it was mentioned. That yeah. was it. Women's, women's Aid released their annual um, audit. Mm -hmm. And in that audit, I, I would like to send it to you, actually. They, the only reason I knew about this audit, because it was forwarded to me by a female MP who said, oh, men get enough support. Um, I know that from women's aid, from their audit, and she forwarded it. And in that audit, it said from the 400 organizations, uh, like domestic abuse organizations, 170 offer a service of sorts, at least one service for men. And that was it. But it didn't mention if that were perpetrator programs, if that was they can call us and we tell them to hang off. <laughs> it didn't say anything about that. And so at one point I would I want actually I want to approach women's aid and say, oh, it's wonderful that you have this list. Could you please send me the list? Uh, with what kind of services they offer men, because it would be really interesting to know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a misrepresentation. Yeah, because one of the, you know, things with the women's aid lines is that the ones for male victims all follow the respect toolkit, you know, and I, I mean, I was surprised because I looked at the respect website and it's actually gender neutral. They actually want that you know, toolkit to be used to screen all, you know, callers to domestic violence hotlines in fairness to them. I still think that it's a really bad idea because what they do is they um, try to ask challenging questions to discern whether this person calling saying they're a victim is actually a perpetrator. And, you know, I think that's, the job of the police or the courts. That's not the job of a domestic abuse helpline. You know, at the point when a victim calls up, you know, and they might be, they might not have um, spoken to anybody else about it. They might feel like they're not going to be believed by people. You know, I think it's incredibly important that they do feel believed and supported by the person on the end of the phone, whether they're a man or a woman. And if that means that, you know, people, operators are, um, you know, tasked with a couple of time wasters and fantasists, I think that's the sort of price that's worth paying, really, to support actual victims. Elizabeth, did you see in the toolkit from Respect that their number one reason experience domestic abuse is there um are there harmful masculinities that's that's their reasoning why men experience domestic abuse because of their toxic masculinity it's in their toolkit um so on page four okay. it, um, uh, first they see what what abusive um, experiences men can experience and that's all great and then the first reason why men experience domestic abuse it's because of their toxic masculinity and their harm yeah and because they tend to be aggressive it's like how is how does that make any sense and would you ever find anything like that for female victims you would never find that 
you may yeah. have found it 50, 60 years ago in, in American mm -hmm. law talking about black crime, you know, and saying, yeah. well, the reason that black people suffer is because black people are very dangerous and they hurt each other. Yeah. Have you looked at the um, the Freedom Programme? Has anybody, anybody had a look at the Freedom Programme? Have you had any experience with the Freedom Programme? Uh, our, one, of our, uh, one of our guys, uh, David Eggins from Temper, he mentioned it by, and he told, talked about it, but I haven't looked into it. You should look into it because the Freedom Programme is a 12-week programme. All women who go through a um, hostile environment with women's aid will be encouraged to go on the Freedom Programme. The Freedom Programme consists of a group of male archetypes that aren't real archetypes in psychology. They are, they are created from a women's aid perspective of what their image about a man and, and a man's identity. And you've got a number of, of, of different archetypes, one being the dominator. So the 12-week 12, 12 programme will go through what types of men there are. None of them are positive. And then it will get the women to identify where their ex-partner sits. Is he a dominator? You know, is, is he coercive control? Is he, so there's all of this language. And then um, I got challenged the other day because I, had, I used to have a lot to do with women's aid because they are, they are, um, tenants used to come into my temporary accommodation as a stepping stone into permanent accommodation. So um, I was very aware of these sorts of programs that they were, and it, and it most definitely is a doctrine. It most definitely is a doctrine. And, and w when, when a woman goes through that process, at the end of it, she's identified every single man. Wherever she goes, she will look at all of these men and then she will align these men with these archetypes. Now that is present in, in every piece of work that comes out of them, that assumption that the men will be one of these characters, okay? Unfortunately, respect and, and everything that they are doing with their accreditation. I've been in, involved in meetings and strategic planning groups where respect are present, perpetrators programs and things like that. Respect, unfortunately, there's, there used to be a line between women's aid and respect. There's no line anymore. You won't see a line between them anymore. No matter yeah. which meeting you go in, they are so interwoven, they're kind of wrapped up in each other to such an extent now that you can't see who's who anymore. And, and, and that's factual, and I'll stand up and say that to anybody. So when you look at respect services and you look at women's aid, if you look at the, the phone calls they're getting to these, these phone lines, okay, um, they will give you, because they're monitored, they will give you how many they get. And they like monitoring because it, it, it ups and ups and ups. But they compare them with the men's helplines the men's helplines, unfortunately, are only open for between four to six hours in a given day, and they're only five days a week. Um, so when you compare them, it will always look like women's have got drastic rise in, in the calls, but it's because men's lines are not available. So there's lots of this stuff that goes on under the scenes that you wouldn't see, and they're very wrapped up in respects processes and how they evaluate, how they credit, um, they're wrapped up in perpetrators programs now. That's why you're not seeing female perpetrator programs because the accreditation process, they're working with governments so that the accreditation process is dominantly with respect. So when anybody wants to deliver a service, they have to go through respect and respect accreditation is very gendered. So it's, it's yeah. just, it's, it's all knitted. It's all relevant. It's all knitted together. Would, would you say, would you say um, that the, the network, the system behind it, I, I, I found it almost criminal. Like when I looked into it, um, to me, it was like looking into like a crime story and it, it very much felt like, yeah, or something um, like putting its roots deeper and deeper into the system and occupying every single part of it so that nobody with opposing views can come in. And what you're saying that you have to be accredited to actually like uh, be supported by the government. So nobody can even ask questions. No, no. And if you look across the UK, yeah, if you look across the UK now, Every police and crime commissioner has either got a co-located women's aid worker working within there, or they, they, the, the domestic abuse side of, of the police and crime commissioner has got ex-women's aid workers in there. If you go into housing, you go into health, you go into social services, you go into the court system, it's the same story. 
okay? This is a network of barriers and it's systemic and it's so toxic to anybody that wants to, even other women. If you're a balanced woman, okay, who wants to deliver the best of herself in whatever her profession is, if you do not align yourself with their practices, you are consistently bullied. Uh, and this goes right up to the top in government. It's not, this is not laid, low laid, you know, it's, it's, it's your experience. From your experience, are there legal ways to challenge some yes. of that? Yes, there's lots of legal ways to challenge it. It's one of the reasons why the campaign was designed the, the way it was designed. So, mm. so there's, for example, one of the acts of law that I looked at in each country was contract law, okay? It's not readily relevant, really. Um, visibly, you wouldn't think it was relevant to the men's movement or, or to equality for men and boys, but contract law governs these kinds of processes. Uh, so I read contract law. That's one of your legal challenges. Um, there's lots of things that go on within that that um, can be challenged through that contract law, procurement law, you know, mm. so, so yes. So so are, so are there issues with um, monopolies? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. They're, I mean, through procurement, you've got women, uh, female projects. Through procurement, the way they work now is that um, procurement is designed to maximize the, the, the service for the spending the government wants to do. Wow. And um, that's a showstopper. <laughs> so that's a showstopper. <laughs> So, so procurement, um, procurement exercises now, the way they do it is you've got, um, you've got first tier, second tier, or consortium um, procurement. So what happens is the bigger your organization, the more chances you've got to get in a contract. Women's Aid is a massive organization with massive resources. They, they're the go-to kind of organization. What women's they do if they got smaller competitive organizations in the community that may do services that they want to deliver they will align draw into consortium and then they will take them over and they yeah. do this systematically so there's lots yeah. of issues that impact and enable that to happen um so yeah but they but they are challengeable they just need people to challenge them you know i mean one of one of the areas we've in, in the 13 areas, one of the areas is law, law and courts. And one of the, the outputs for us is the first two years of the campaign is did you know? So it's raising awareness and it's working with people like all of you, you know, and just telling your stories and getting the media out there and, and letting people know what it's like to be you and try and do what you're doing. So it's yeah. did you know? The last, the, the third year is if we haven't seen a shift or even an acknowledgement, the third year is legal challenge for me. So yeah. I, I'm already looking for a, a, an international legal firm who can deal with a legal challenge. Yeah. So, because I think that's pretty much the, the last straw, but it's the only way you can go. And you need to formulate that. And that's, that's what we're hoping to do. See, what feminists would never ever accept is just how damaging it is to teach women you know that uh, as you said there, there's a, a plethora of um men to for them to evaluate all of them are negative and then they take that with them out into the rest of their lives and they see that everywhere they go um <clears throat> in university i was uh, told that questions i were uh, i was asking um were threatening and harassing um to the students and staff and i said who did i threaten mm -hmm. and they said oh no 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 it's not that you threatened somebody it's that people felt that you were threatened uh, that, that you were threatening and you were harassing um you know and 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 you have to validate their fears and you have to understand that that's totally um their right to feel like that mm -hmm. and see the thing is i um I have suffered for a long time with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, it's, I'm, I'm a lot better at dealing with, with it now than I used to be. Um, but when I had the most irrational fears in the world, you know, and I, I was terrified of millions of different things, 
my therapists would say to me, you know, well, you have to use reason, you have to use logic and you have to deconstruct it and ask if it's, if, if what you're afraid of is, is reality. Um, you have to desensitize yourself to it. You have to slowly move into areas that, that make you feel that fear and, and know that what you're feeling is not rational or reasonable. Um, you know, if they had validated my fears in order to be courteous or, or because, you know, they, they felt that um, it would be wrong or it would be shaming for them to tell me that my fears were not rational, um, then I would still be there. I would be worse. You know, like my, my illness would have consumed me. The, the fact that I was told by, um, you know, staff members that the the questioning the questions i was asking were making people feel threatened and making them feel harassed and that that was my responsibility because i i can choose whether i threaten somebody but i can't choose whether they feel threatened that's purely up to them mm -hmm. um but but that i have to validate their fears and i have to amend my behavior in order to make them more comfortable like you know that that's ridiculous because because then they carry that fear then they feel that um, that your questions were genuinely threatening and harassing and they were in danger. The, the, the healthy thing to do is to say to them, well, hang on, this is a politics class. People are going to disagree with you. People are going to have alternative opinions. You're not always going to like what they have to say, but that's the nature of the beast. Rather than saying, oh, well, if you come into a politics class, and somebody says something that doesn't immediately align with everything you believe, that was wrong of them. They, yeah. they hurt you, they harmed you. You know, politics is stressful, debate is stressful. It is difficult to fight your corner, but that's what you entered into. And there's no obligation for the other side to tell you what you want to hear just because you're too cowardly to, to grow a thicker skin. So I, you know, I was really annoyed with the fact that the university was validating this kind of ridiculous uh, attitude, not simply because it put me in the awkward position of having to work around them, but because these girls were actually being told that they were right to feel like that, rather than, the, the, than dealing with those emotions and learning that actually they were in no danger whatsoever, it was just a different opinion, and if they, if they disagree, they're perfectly welcome to come back with counter arguments. Mm -hmm. You're exactly but, right. But, but women, unfortunately, nowadays are really trained to uh, not be strong, to to feel threatened, and and I think that our current uh, social climate um, harms women just as ma just as much as men. Um, men are overlooked and women are being kept anxious and uh, for example well, to, to create to create leadership you have to create people to lead and unfortunately currently the feminist movement creates victims and it tells mm. people you need to be part of us and our whole otherwise you're not going to be safe you yeah. need our support because look at this big bad world out there and without us, you're not going to succeed and you're not going to thrive. So it, it, but it's all about the power. It's not about that need or identified support or, or anything. It's about leaders needing somebody to lead. And that, that's created most definitely with, in some of these feminist groups, some of these, I mean, particularly with the Freedom Programme, and, and perhaps you should have a look at it, because they've now, I found out two weeks ago, they've created a children's Freedom Programme. And to me, this was very shocking because I know how damaging the Freedom Program was to women's psyche and their independence and feeling like they, you know, they could survive. And, and, and to think that there's a children's one in the world now and they've launched that, to me, is, uh, for me, it's an urgency. I need to look at it and need to, mm. to see whether it needs to have media coverage. Mm. 